So uh, I'm Swanee Hunt, and hello, Carla. Uh, a former colleague of Carla Capels. Delighted to see you here, uh, and I have the honor of being the chair of the Institute for Inclusive Security, which uh, Ms. Capel used to direct before she became the the czarina of all things women and girls for the U.S. Uh, aid, no, our foreign aid program. Our topic here is looking at the, some very specific best practices that go into the full implementation of the UN Security Council Resolution 1325. And as you know, there are some national action plans that 37 countries have produced. Some of them are quite strong, some of them are struggling, but I, if you look at countries around the world, people are in various different stages of knowing how to or having the resources to uh, address the, the great uh, challenge of this UN Security Council resolution that says that women must be fully engaged and leading in uh, peace processes of all kinds. And so uh, I am going to say literally less than two minutes about how I come to this subject, and then I want to spend the time with our uh, illustrious speakers here, and almost all of whom I've had the pleasure to know. And, and I know quite a few of you too, and so this is going to be a, meant as a discussion now, as you know, the uh, schedule is a little bit uh, upside down, but that's all right. We will make the most of it with our enthusiasm and our uh, intellectual uh, exchange here. All right, so I'm, uh, I was the American ambassador to Austria for four years, 93 to 97, during the first term of the Clinton administration. And in the course of that, had the remarkable experience of hosting uh, negotiations between two warring parts of uh, former Yugoslavia inside of Bosnia, uh, the Bosniaks, uh, who, are, who are identified externally often as the Muslims, and then the Croats, but that included, of course, Croats in Bosnia, but as we all know, very much supported by the, the Croat state under President Tuchman. Uh, these negotiations were all male, which I didn't notice until the uh, signing of the agreement at the White House, which was really striking to me, who had been so involved in women's issues. So that was this moment for me, because I was looking through a security lens, not a gender lens, and so I completely missed it. And um, so then I was asked by a great internationalist, uh, Joe Nye, Joseph Nye, who came up with the idea of soft power, if I would come to the Kennedy School of Government, and that's where I've been teaching for 15 years, and in the course of that, very early on, brought women together, 110 women from 10 conflicts. We called it Women Waging Peace. And out of that grew a lot of policy advocacy work all across Europe, all across the world. That, uh, that gathering of women is now more than 2,000 women. And uh, in terms of that network, and the institute that grew out of it is called the Institute for Inclusive Security. It is DC-based. DC there are about 25 people uh, in the institute, and um, there are several of you here who've been quite involved. I'm looking particularly at Henri Van Egan, and with thanks for your support and your good work with us as we launch an even newer larger initiative out of that institute called Resolution to Act, drawing from UN Security Council Resolution 1325 to National Action Plans, Resolution to Act. And uh, we are just going to be launching that actually in March, although we announced it at the Clinton Global Initiative. Now, I am going to turn to you, Madam President, to Chandrika Kamar. Kamaratunga, is that all right? Kumaratunga. Oh, come on. Do you say it again? Kumaratunga. Kumaratunga. I said Kama. You do it one more time. Kumaratunga. Kumaratunga. You all can just call it's her too Chandrika. Long. Or you can call her Madam President. Just That's Chandrika. Uh -huh. Kumaratunga. Okay? 
good. You all have her bio. It would take a, a good part of this session to to tell you the um, the outstanding achievements that she had had, but particularly ones that came that popped out to me was her insistence on a political solution to the violence in Sri Lanka. <coughs> and so I, I want to ask you a very basic question and ask you if you will speak to us for um, four or five minutes about whatever is on your mind in terms of what you have learned, in terms of what works for elevating women and how we how we get past the uh, wh what are the obstacles that particularly in conflict situations what are the greatest obst obstacles for women and what have you found even if it's just one example uh, that that from your own experience is something that we all could learn from. If your question is about the time of war, not uh, afterwards, uh, when peace. When I, I'm, when we think about there is, the, there is during, there's prevention of a war, there's stopping a war, mm -hmm. and there's that post-conflict state that is so fragile that it's often actually a pre-conflict situation. Mm -hmm. As we know, 50% of the peace agreements fail, so you just go round and round. So, however you want to address that. Well, I would say it would take a long time, so try, I'll try to be very brief. Yes. Um, I think at every stage, pre-conflict, conflict, and post-conflict stages, we're talking <coughs> of women, um, what is most important in all countries, the developed and the developing, and more so in the developing countries, is to make women aware of the important role they can play and they have to play in, uh, in conflict. Very often, here I'm talking of my country and similar countries of the region. Um, can you all hear back there? Is the mics or no? Women, yeah. can, is this not working? So may I make a suggestion? We're going to speak louder up here, but we have I'll about, try to speak louder. we have literally 15 seats up here. I would strongly urge you to, to just stand up and move up here. Um, I think you'll be able to be more engaged if you do. They're all, you trust me, there are all these seats. <laughs> you can't see them. I would not lead you wrong. My job as moderator you won't is, fall to tell you, is to tell you that these seats exist. They are on the second, first, second, and third rows that you can't see. You're invited to come closer. Just you, the last one to walk in, you're invited to walk, come closer. <laughs> Because one is trying for a long time to put everyone in front. Yes, yes so I'm I've been to trying. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes, yes, I was saying what is most important is to make the women uh, realize first that they do have an active role to play as much as the men. Uh, because in the developing countries, uh, because of what we were talking about in the previous session, I think you were not there. Mm. Um, I heard a lot of it. Uh, women are still not considered, generally, by society as equal to the men. So therefore, they themselves underestimate themselves and their perception of themselves and the role they can play in most things, especially in, uh, in times of conflict, which is considered a manly thing, uh, limited to, to the males. Uh, they do not fully realize. So I think it is first uh, awareness amongst the women, mm -hmm. then creating an awareness amongst the men and society in general that the women do have an equal and important role to play. And of course for this education is very important and in our part of the world, in most countries the women are much less educated and have less access to education facilities than the men. So that is also that becomes part of it. Then also I think representation women's representation in elected bodies. Right. 
is weak in our part of the country, you'll be surprised. My country, Sri Lanka, produced <coughs> the first world's first woman prime minister right. 50 years ago, more than 50 years ago, right. 52 years ago. And one of the world's first women presidents, executive presidents. But at, we have about 3% women representing represented in parliament. Three? Yes. Oh, sorry to hear that. So, you know, it's strange. And we have three levels of uh, elected bodies, the local government, uh, then we have the provincial councils, mm -hmm. and then the, and then par national parliament. And I, uh, India has adopted uh, the policy of quotas. We were talking about quotas, Prime Minister Jospin yeah. was talking about how they did that in France. Um, especially for the underprivileged uh, communities, as well as women. Mm -hmm. So quotas or whatever, I think we have to have some policy where women will get their uh, due representation in the elected bodies. That is also extremely important to ensure that women play an active role in, um, in uh, operations such as uh, peace, ensuring uh, security or in the pre-conflict stage of uh, preventing conflict. Right, right. Um, so that, that is as a, you know, as, as policy that what I can see. Uh, you asked about experience. Yeah. I led a country for 11 years which was at war. Um, a rebel group fighting against the state, uh, for a separate state. A very, very ruthless group of terrorists. They had the largest number of suicide bombers until the Al-Qaeda came along, though we were proportionately a small, small population. Um, there the situation was rather strange because the, the rebels used a lot of women as uh, fighting carders. Fighting. Carders, mm -hmm. fighting, uh, you know, in the armies, in their rebel armies. Personnel. 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 Uh, and all the suicide bombers, m almost all of them were women. They were trained to be suicide bombers, highly trained. And the women lit uh, actually went out and fought the, the, uh, the military, against the military. Um, on the other hand, the military did use the weapon <coughs> of rape. President Clinton, just a little while ago, talked about using the weapon of rape in war and in conflict. Even our military did that. Not in a very big way, but to some extent. Right. To some extent. Um, and this I was able to put a stop to, because the first incident that we knew during my presidency of, well, uh, I must just say within brackets that as I came into government, we offered negotiations, ceasefire, end to fighting, and a negotiated settlement. We said we cannot give everything you are asking for. We cannot give a separate state, but we will give, uh, we, are, we will offer extensive federalism, uh, devolution of political power. Um, so we discussed with the rebels, but then they broke the discussions off because they wanted a separate state and started fighting. Um, and there was one case of, uh, well, one case that came to be known of uh, seven or eight soldiers raping one Tamil uh, girl, young girl, in the fighting zone. And I immediately took action. We. Uh, instituted a legal process which had not de until then been used in the country even, which was called trial by jury, where you uh, have a trial with judges, but very, very quickly done without yeah. dragging it on. Eight soldiers were found guilty. They were jailed and all that kind of thing. And thereafter, at my instigation, we started a training unit within the forces to train the personnel, Army, Navy, Air Force who were fighting in the, in the north and east of the country uh, on humanitarian issues. Mm -hmm. It sounds contradictory, but how to, how to <coughs> behave with civilians, 
how to behave with the prisoners of war mm -hmm. and all this kind of thing. Luckily, we did have still uh, at the leadership levels of the, of the three armed forces people who believed in that, some right. of them. So we used right. that. So we used that kind of thing and we were able to render uh, the, well, the behavior of the forces to some extent um, within inverted commas humane. Right, right. And um, apart from that, women's participation overall in, you see, we had a massive campaign amongst the people, the majority community, uh, that once again, as my government came in, uh, we had a, a French company, Sofres. Uh, doing a, uh, we invited them to do a, a Gallup poll yes. amongst the majority community, the Sinhalese, which I belong. Right. Seventy-five percent of the population is Sinhalese. Right. About fifteen percent Tamil, mm -hmm. and the others are Muslim. Mm -hmm. um, and only twenty-three percent of the majority community agreed that the war should be ended through a negotiated settlement. They all thought it should be, uh, you know, it should be resolved by war. Mm -hmm. Now, I personally knew <coughs> through my dealings with people all over the country, I had, you know, I, I did a job for the government earlier, mm -hmm. where I was with the people mm -hmm. in the villages, talking with them, working with them, then politically, that the majority of the majority people did not really believe this, but it was only because the political leaders uh, had not used any other discourse other than that of war. Yes, right, right. So I said, let us begin talking about peace to the people. Mm -hmm. We had a massive campaign for two years. We conducted a campaign, mm -hmm. uh, workshops, mm -hmm. seminars, street theater was used massively mm -hmm. from village to village, to uh, only in mainly in the areas where the majority community lived. Mm -hmm. And it was easy to do that because they live in separate areas. Um, and at the end of two years, we had did a, uh, another Gallup poll. Yes. And the 23% had increased to 68%, mm -hmm. saying yes to power sharing and you know right. equal rights to the minorities and all that. Now, in this campaign, women were also uh, hugely uh, used you know, right. to talk to people. Yes. Uh, for example, we have 200, a body of 200,000 school teachers in Sri Lanka. Uh, about 75% of them are women, the teachers. So we used a large number of those people who had who thought like us. Yes. They were trained first about you know how, how to do this and then right. to talk to people, to go to the villagers, to talk to public right. servants, leading public servants, professionals. Yes. Those yes. actually I did. Uh, we had big seminars, talking to them, convincing them. And then at the, within in a short period of two years. It worked. And, and I have heard about this. I have heard about this over and over. You don't know, but this is world renowned, what you did there. It's an example for other countries. And I and you also used, I think, uh, radio programming and- <coughs> Everything, and, the and media had, was fully used. Yes, like almost like a sitcom. I can't remember, it, but anyway, playing out, well, if peace does come, Every, you know, it's not going to be as nice as you think, you know, like preparing people so they don't become disillusioned. I mean, it's, it is spectacular. And that's the kind of very concrete example that I hope that we can do. That you know, when, you, when you say, well, awareness is important, that's one thing. But if you tell us that you were out there using street theater, theater. And, and media and going into the villages, that really gives us a sense of possibility. That, that's very, very helpful. But I must now underline yes. <laughs> <laughs> that having achieved all that, we were moving slowly forward, right. even persuading the very intransigent rebels, though the rebel leader himself was not convinced, his people began to change. They started leaving his, uh, his ranks and running away, looking yeah. for jobs in, in the capital city and all that. Yes. So the break was coming, you know. Uh, Peace was slowly the message of peace was winning, right? And we achieved uh, other material uh, 
successors, which uh, I may not have the time to describe here. But then the government changed, the presidency changed, and in a short period of a few years, mm -hmm. they have been able to change the attitudes of the people again. Yeah. And new data shows that once again the majority community is very aggressive and you know saying what rights do the Tamil people have. Uh, they have got whatever they deserve and you know that I have heard this. I have stopped talking to a large number of friends. So it's very easy to to change the minds of people if the context is is uh, fruit, you know is uh, fertile. If you use the right uh, right tactics and strategies, but it is equally easy to change it back. Right. Thank you. And and um, our next speaker knows a lot about that. Uh, actually, uh, this is Latko Lagumchia. Perfect. <laughs> yes, Lagumchia. <laughs> of course, it isn't. But we are old friends. Your name uh, is easier to pronounce than mine. Of course, Lagumchia. <laughs> Uh, quite, quite long. And I remember so well when I was writing a book, I've written two books about the situation in Bosnia, where, where Zlatko was deputy prime minister uh, in 92, but foreign minister, he's you know, been in the parliament, I mean, he's, he's been a major force, uh, the head of the uh, Social Democratic Party, and everyone knows you and respects you there. Well, almost everyone. And you, so we, we shows that we are democracy, right? Yeah, that's right. That's what I was just saying. You don't want everyone to. Uh, but I remember one of the women I was interviewing for one of my books, she said, you know, the propaganda, it comes in such small bits. And it comes over and over and over and over. And she said, you, you just don't recognize it becomes, because it comes in these very small bits. And, you know, Frankly, this is not about Sri Lanka. This is not about Bosnia. This is about humanity. I mean, certainly in the United States, we have that experience. So could you tell us in your experience what you have seen as, in particular, the how women have either what, taken on more power in terms of stabilizing or how they have not, and what you see as the obstacles. What is the role <coughs> that men have played in Bosnia in helping or in hindering that? Well, um, first I want to clarify the very quick answer mm. for the major title. A peace and security process sufficiently inclusive to be considered so socially just and effective? The answer is no. <laughs> Book two, that's it. Thank you. Now let's talk a little bit about exactly what you said. <laughs> It's m such a big evidence about that no, and of course, I mean, based on what we're talking about, we should learn some lessons and maybe have some common thoughts that right. we can use in the future. Uh, a few days ago, uh, ICTI, or International Hague Tribunal, uh, made a second verdict for one general <coughs> who was actually executing uh, the Srebrenica massacre, right. and he was the second guy who was sentenced for the genocide. Uh, after G General Galish, who was actually sentenced for genocide for besiege of Sarajevo. Uh, back in 92, I was Deputy Prime Minister, then acting Prime Minister later on, and I was witnessing the first, first cases of something which we couldn't imagine that would be possible. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of literature about you wrote a lot about it, there were a lot of research about it, there were even uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, movies about it. <coughs> about actually what President Clinton ended our session with, about raping of women as a military vehicle to conquire the land, to humiliate people. And uh, uh, first, that started happening right in the very beginning of the besiege of Sarajevo, in the very beginning of the war in Bosnia. And the things came to such a uh, uh, stage in which they were actually keeping women until they become pregnant so they cannot, they have to deliver a child and then they give them back to another part of the front line. That's what I was witnessing back in 92 and the beginning of 93. And uh, which leads to the very simple conclusion. When it starts that way, the, the wars started, the wars that started with that mechanism, with these mechanisms, these atrocities, 
they end as a genocide. People who are capable of doing such a thing, starting the war with such a cruelties on women, on the end, they really literally have no limits with their atrocities and with their monster minds. And on the end, they actually uh, end the, the war with committing something which is probably the, uh, the last stage of atrocities in war, which is genocide. That's one point. Second point is, I think that uh, our war ended without justice. Yeah. Our war ended with stopping the war. And of course, uh, our war is probably the best example of military success of the ending of the war. Because there is no evidence, correct me if I'm wrong, of one major war that was stopped by international community when international forces were deployed and no one literally got even wounded not saying killed in any kind of combat activity. So from military perspective, that was perfect. 100% success. No one single 30,000 deployed soldiers was even wounded in combat activity, not being killed. But 17 years or 20 years after the war, yeah. we are witnessing the first signs of justice being coming with a, in a hate. So the first point is what I'm trying to say is that uh, first precondition for, 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 for fulfillment of the goals that we are talking about is justice. Pure justice and then social justice as a, as let's say, subset of justice. Second thing is, and I'm talking about urgent, <coughs> the most urgent thing in such a situation is to show that justice is coming. The most important thing is to show that justice is there. That you don't have to wait 10, 15, or 20 years for justice. Of course, comforting thing, is to say that, well, justice will come on the end, that we can be sure. But justice has to be starting. In Bosnia case, it did not start so soon. The second thing is something that we talk about, and uh, Prime Minister Jospin was very precise about quotas. I'm talking about now something which is maybe technicality. But we had, because in Bosnia we had a lot of elections. Uh, whatever was the question, uh, in Bosnia in post-conflict situation, whatever was the question, the answer was democracy. And when you said, what about democracy? The answer was elections. So that's the reason why we had, I think, six, seven elections in eight or nine years. Uh, first elections were driven by OICE, international missions. We had three elections being conducted by international missions. First one, I'm talking about, about gender issue now. The first one, it was proportional lists, just like in with Lionel was talking about proportional system, proportional list. Uh, first elections resulted with a parliament of Bosnia and Herzegovina fully fooled by men because no single woman was elected in the parliament because it was party lists one, two, three. Some party got one seat, some party got seven, eight seats because we have small parliament or 12 seats, but even the parties who won 15 seats, the biggest number they had zero women. Your 17% number was wrong. Yeah. Uh, now, now, so then OECE said, let's do something. Well, were the women at the bottom of we, the list? What, no, mean, well, women, were, were, women were simply, no party had reason to have women because it was not obliged by the law. Oh. And major parties were simply not putting women and they were putting them on the bottom of the list just for fun. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I was running the party who has a uh, number two person on the list. Uh -huh. But we got only one seat in the parliament. And actually, I'm coming from multi-ethnic party, which is only multi-ethnic party representing Boston parliament. And as a matter of fact, on those first elections, I was uh, actually the only member of the parliament from my party. So that's the reason why we were not multi-ethnic as well. <laughs> because it would be kind of uh, complicated right. to be on myself. But uh, <laughs> later on, I mean, when we extended the number of seats, we were multi-ethnic. But uh, what we did as a party, we promoted the gender issue back in 95 and 96. What, is, what was the result of it? Today in the parliament, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, we have 17% of women, right? 17% uh, of women, and 40% of MPs from my party are women, because it, it does not depend on the law. But law that was init initially organized by OEC in order to have gender issue that out of uh, three 
mem members on the list. Two have to be of more, no more than two have to be from the same gender. Uh -huh. uh, as a result, as a matter of fact, number one and two seats, is, it has to be male and female, or in whatever direction. And then on every three slots on a list, it has to be two, one, in whatever ratio. Uh, as a result, on second elections, we had increase of women in the parliament. But then someone from OEC said that we said we need more democracy. More democracy was to have so-called opened lists. Yeah. Okay? That you can jump over some. You know what was the result? Again, decrease yeah. of the number of women. Now, <laughs> we are trying to change election law to come back <coughs> to the original position. And the funny thing is that we've been attacked by a lot of people who are talking that it's not democracy. It's not democracy because we want to, to have closed lists in order to provide ethnic distribution as a multi-ethnic party, ethnic, and provide gender issue, and have young people if possible. Because young people are not so, uh, let's say, pro they are not competing for themselves. They are competing for the bigger cause. And that's the reason why on open list they don't get, jump up. Women don't jump up. Only technocrats, apparatchiks jump up on an open list. And as a result, so now what I'm trying to say is that, I mean, yeah. and, and of course, the third point which I would like to make is, uh, it's, uh, this is something which is about uh, quotas, I wanted to say something, something about justice, and the third thing, I think, when whatever is the question, the answer is education. <laughs> Not democracy, but education. Education, education, again and again. And we have to invest a little bit more in educating of the people about the issues that we are talking about. Not only about formal education, but right. promoting this, promoting the concept of shared society, promoting concept of uh, being united in diversities, promoting those kind of values in a little bit more brave, brave scale. And by the way, 17% is the right number. You see the distribution here, in here? I represent 17%. <laughs> Both one gender of this panel. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, the number is there. I, I remember talking to a, a friend of mine who said I was on the list for my party, and I was number three on the list, and I was from Mostar. And by the time I drove to Sarajevo, you know, for or whatever it was, the day that the list would be announced, I was number eighteen. And it was all done behind closed doors. And she said there was no, you know, no one knew how I went from three to 18, except for men putting themselves, you know, pushing themselves forward. It's exactly to your point. Well, thank you for adding that. So now as we talk about these issues that we're accumulating and, and in terms of real practices, uh, a couple of you have talked about education, educating the people, whether it's through, through the classroom, but also just in the villages, on the streets, uh, through the media. Uh, you've talked about justice and particularly looking at the crimes against women. And I think that's really significant. I'm, my guess is that you're going to go there as well. So let's stay with that theme in our minds because that isn't just, oh, you did something wrong to me. That is, you made a huge statement about the value of women and the role of women you know, in not just our society, but in stopping what is going on here. And then we do have to talk about the whole election piece and, and how we break past that. Uh, a lot of us in this room have been working on this for in the United States. I'm going to turn, Carol, to you, to Vice Admiral is it Pottinger? Pottinger. Yeah, great. So you see, <laughs> she it's, get with the Americans. Americans. <laughs> it's with Americans too. It's with Americans too, Pottinger. Okay, would you t explain to us at, in your first line about what it means to be the Deputy Chief of Staff for Capability Development of the NATO Headquarters Supreme Allied Commander Transformation? It's a long explanation, just like it's a long also, title. Do you have a card on which that fits? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, I will, very briefly, Please, uh, yes, because we, we are short for time here, and I, I, I want to talk about what NATO is doing yes. for UNSCR 1325, and then a little bit about my own experience and how I think we could do more in terms of militaries for uh, opportunity for women. 
Um, I uh, am the Deputy Chief of Staff at Allied Command Transformation. It's one of two strategic headquarters for NATO. The other one is Allied Command Operations in Belgium, uh, and that commander is Admiral Jim Stavridis, who some of you may know. His counterpart is my boss, a French general, Jean-Paul Palomeros. And uh, my command's mission is to bring transformation to NATO, to look into the future and deliver the capabilities that the NATO and 28 nations and partners need to be prepared for the future, whether that's cyber defense, missile defense, cloud computing, you name it, we work across the board on all of those capabilities. But one of those capabilities is obviously the people in NATO, in nations, in militaries, in security and defense. So on that score, let me just kind of sketch for you quickly, just in the last couple of years, what NATO has been doing to implement UNSCR 1325 specifically. And I'm going to talk about it since I am a military officer, though right now I'm speaking about NATO writ large as a pole mill organization in strategic, operational, and tactical terms. And I know so, you like these long titles, but you can just say 1325. We'll know 1325, what you mean. got it. So in strategic terms, uh, two summits, two NATO summits in the last couple of years, the Lisbon summit in 2010 and the Chicago summit just last June. In 2010, at the Lisbon summit, a NATO action plan for 1325 was approved by the heads of state and government, a big step forward. And we've talked about the 30 or 40 national action plans out there. I think, I don't know this for sure, but I think probably most of those are coming from NATO nations or NATO partners. And so in large part, I think NATO has really done a, a, a leadership service here in terms of leading and convincing and persuading nations to develop national action plans. Yeah, they're not perfect, but it's something to put on paper and to hold people accountable to. I think that's really important. Leadership can hold people accountable to carry out those steps of the national action plan. W what else has NATO done on a strategic front? Here in Chicago, they just appointed a special uh, envoy for 1325, Marie Skare from Norway, a fantastic lady, and I just met her a couple months ago, and so she now will help to lead this discussion across NATO about why this is so important to implement these national action plans and to have this uh, dialogue. Um, also for, at the strategic level, we have seen the Secretary General put out a uh, directive that lists the actions to take at the operational and tactical levels that I'm going to talk about in a minute. And again, it's about accountability. So the NATO Secretary General and Heads of State and Government have all agreed in ISAF, in K4, Kosovo, in Afghanistan, in operations that NATO is involved in, these actions will be taken to help to implement 1325. Okay, so what are some of those uh, actions at the operational level? Uh, the senior commanders in Afghanistan and ISAF and Kosovo have a gender advisor appointed to advise them about gender perspective. Uh, gender perspective is not about equal opportunity. Gender perspective is not about women. Gender perspective is bringing to the operational commander, the four stars in charge of operations, how do they take into account the perspective of gender, male and female, to ensure that their operations are the most effective possible, whether it's operations in creating a zone for peace, whether it's operations in combat, whether it's operations in counter IED, whatever the operations is, that advisor can help that commander to craft their operations to take that perspective into account. So this is really significant. It might be a best practice. I don't know. It might be something that others could take away. Um, something else that they've done uh, in theater is training. Um, all troops that go to operations led by NATO have to go through gender training. And we can make this courseware available to anyone that wants it. We've got it online. We've got handouts. We've got booklets, uh, handbooks. So this is really critical. So this isn't just for the military forces <coughs> in NATO that are in those operations, again, in Afghanistan or Kosovo or elsewhere but it's also for the troop contributing nations and the partners of NATO. And it's also for the forces, the Afghan National Security Force and the uh, security forces in Kosovo, the indigenous forces, to be able to get this training, understand why 1325 is so important and why they need to train their forces to be able to operate in that environment, um, specifically in conflict to protect women and children. So that's kind of one side of the coin of 1325. Um, another side of the coin of 1325 that I would like to talk about in my military guise is when I came to NATO about two and a half years ago, I assumed because NATO was comprised of European nations, obviously Canada and the U.S. and North America, 
and the rest, mostly Western democracies, most had been around for a long time, that there would be an abundance of women in NATO's military forces, and there are not, and I was shocked. Um, and I have yet to meet more than a handful of flag and general officers like I am in these forces, whether you're talking about France, whether you're talking about Italy, or in fact, in Italy, women could just start to serve in their military forces 10 years ago. They couldn't even serve until 10 years ago. This was remarkable to me. So this is another area that I have personally been a champion of, and I'm doing it with the nation of Bulgaria, because that happens to be a deputy defense minister, a female deputy defense minister who's very passionate about this as well. We're leading a program, a project, to try to figure out how to make opportunity available to women leaders in security and defense, how to create the environment, the atmosphere, the policies, and change the culture so those women can succeed. And it's not just in military, it's in foreign ministries and across that realm of security and defense sector. But I will tell you, you've heard a lot this morning about um, the political emphasis on getting women into parliaments and as prime ministers and as presidents. We've even talked about women in business. We've talked about women in academia. I never hear groups like this, and I've done a lot of traveling and speaking in forums, I never hear them really talk about helping women in militaries to gain leadership positions. And boy, isn't that important. If you're talking about prevention of rape, or if you're talking about women and children in conflict zones, or if you're talking about a gender perspective, it's not that you're a woman and you're the only one who brings those things, but you certainly do bring them. And until we can make the opportunity available for women to succeed in the security and defense sector, I think we're missing a big part of that population discussion we had about talent and intellect and competitiveness and the ability to contribute. Um, so this is an area that maybe uh, the political leadership of the Club de Madrid could think about taking on. And not, you know, don't just stop talking about women in government and women in political leadership, talk about women in military leadership. How many nations out there, and I spend a lot of time in the Pacific, how many nations out there are very patriarchal? They're very male dominated in their militaries. Um, just bringing some women in just changes the perspective. It just helps the military force to be more ready, and it helps, I think, the nation possibly to move uh, more towards uh, democracy. Thank you. So that's kind of some, maybe some best practices and some thoughts. Very, very important. Thank you. And, and some of us have been involved, for example, with Liberia and seen how Ellen Johnson Sirleaf came in and she said, here is my target. Uh, here's my target percentage. And when I hear about Italy, you know, and I think mm -hmm. that, that President Johnson Sirleaf said, I want 20% and I want it like mm -hmm. now. No, and then and all that she went through to get women mm -hmm. to even show up for mm -hmm. the recruitment days. And so anyway, we have a lot to talk to you about for you to teach us about in the next day, too. Uh, may I now introduce uh, Camelia, right? You have done such important work in Sudan, and uh, you were involved in negotiations in 2005 to in that war, and and now you're trying to influence the talks in the Nuba region. So give us some kind of, uh, take, take us in there, okay? Take us in there and give us some kind of glimpse into what happens to you when or other women when, when you come in to have that influence. And how are you effective and, and, and what stops you? What are your ideas about how, how you push past? Uh, thank you so much. My name is Camilla Ibrahim Kuku. I'm uh, from Sudan. And actually, I'm um, holding or a founder of an organization called NUEDA. NUEDA is um, a female organization. Uh, it's uh, NUBA Women for Education Development Association. Um, and also, I'm a member of G40. and. Uh, I really want to give thanks to for G40 whom they give me this chance to come and participate in these events. Uh, just briefly about the overview on the issue of G40. The G40 for some of us who do not know anything about, about it, is a regional alliance of women leadership, uh, leaders from diverse um, professions, teachers, business, uh, humanitarian workers, 
um, researchers, political scientists, um, historians, social workers, human rights. Those are the group under this um, uh, uh, the group of uh, of women as uh, as as um, peace leaders or as uh, uh, leaders for peace in, in the Horn of Africa. And when I talk on the, about the Horn of Africa, there were nine countries. There were nine countries. There were eight countries, but there are now nine because Sudan, after the suppression, become two: Sudan, South Sudan, uh, Somali, Somaliland, and uh, Ethiopia. Uganda and and um, uh, and Eritrea, yes, there are now nine countries, um, and th we are. This project is initiated uh, by three uh, main organizations or networks. That is ISIS Wiki, uh, and ISIS Women International Cross Cultural Exchange, and there is a strategic uh, initiative for women in the Horn of Africa, which is SAIHA. Um, actually, the, the, the pro this project brought about 40 women across this Horn of Africa, these areas or these countries that I mentioned, as leaders, and they had uh, 10 high-level mission in the uh, last year project. Um, it was very useful for the women to be strength and build the capacity in areas of um, uh, enhancing their leadership and, and uh, also meeting with their leaders and lobbying and advocating for the issues of women in the Horn of Africa. Uh, but yet you find that all these agreements that we are, uh, um, we are made in, 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 in the Horn of Africa, we are not really honored and we are not really implemented. So you find that women are still pursuing this issue of implementing or looking for, is or lo looking for peace in, uh, in the Horn of Africa. Um, the regional alliance, uh, uh, or this African, um, uh, uh, African group, they are really actually working together to make sure that they have influenced their leaders in this um, uh, issue of peace <coughs> in Africa. Um, just briefly to maybe share, uh, share about the situation in, in Nuba Mountain, where I'm coming from. And by the way, I'm looking at that clock there. Okay. So the buses are going to leave at 6.30, so we have to keep it. Oh, okay. I'm just warning you. I'm just warning you because our time got crunched so yeah, it's much. Fine. Yeah. And uh, the violence in Nuba Mountain, uh, after the, the peace, um, uh, after the Comprehensive Peace Agreement 2005, uh, where uh, the uh, South Sudan, South um, Blue Nile, and uh, uh, Nuba Mountain, that is South Kordofan, they are given uh, the uh, popular consultation protocol, and it was supposed to be implemented. And so, after a lot of work of women and other civil society organizations, and personally, I was involved in this issue of raising awareness for women on issue of election and bringing the women and uh, teaching them about the importance of their voice. And actually it was very good and, and we see the result. But it was unfortunately later on when it was not, uh, the result was not really um, accepted by the government. And so uh, the region went back for, for war. And up to this time, uh, the region is still on war, in conflict. And, but you find the situation of women is really miserable. Women coming from Nuba Mountain to cross the border to South Sudan, where they trek almost 15 days of trekking, women carrying their children to cross this uh, border to Ida Kam. And in Ida Kam is another story, if I want to talk about it, where there are a lot of violations of, of women's rights. We have in Ida Kam about three over 3,000 children who are unaccompanied. So almost three, three months, you find that the child is living. They don't know where the father is. They don't know where the mother is because they just run away. And now in Nuba Mountain, in, 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 uh, in, in my own region, uh, over 400 people or 400,000 people are still under the caves, under the mountains. So 
those people have no access for food, have no access for water, and the bombardment is almost five, six times a day. So you find that these people are living in a very miserable. And that's why I, 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 I really support my colleague here when he started by the issue of security. What is security? Maybe we are talking about leadership, increase of women in, 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 uh, in government, increase of women in participation in politics. But actually, in, at my region, I'm looking, for is in, I'm looking for security for this at this level, uh, human, human security, body security for women. <coughs> this, is, this is why I'm really looking for the security, family security. Families are scattered. Your children are somewhere else. The mother is somewhere else. The father is somewhere else. So at, this, is, this is why I'm really talking that if we are talking about security, that is the security that we are talking about. Yes, other securities, other security is we are for, for it and we are going for it, this political and all this. But actually, in my own case, I'm talking about this at this level. So, this. Amelia, this is true in Nova Mountain, it's true, and we know in some other places, right? But it, when you think about what you hope that people would be doing in the face of that <coughs> desperation, can you give us like one example where you think, oh, if only other people would be replicating, would be doing the same as what I have seen? What would that be? Actually, what is needed right now is that the two parties should come back to the table. I think this is a political issue, and it needs, we need to encourage the two parties to, uh, uh, to reach into the solution of resolving this issue in order to have peace on the ground. The other thing, the missing or the, the, um, uh, the women are not really represented, even in the past previous of negotiations. Women are not there. And women have done a lot of and very great work in, in conflict, in taking care of their families, in uh, raising awareness for education. There are teachers all over. And you find that, but at the same time, they are not giving um, that uh, opportunity when, when it comes for, for people to go for negotiation. And you find that men going for negotiation alone and also omitting the women's issues. And they are not, right. sure. they are not sure. even bringing women issues. And sure. therefore, they, it's very important for women to be on the table also and participate in negotiation. And that's what we have seen over and over and over, that, that you, can, you can be at the grassroots, you can say, how do we get these people out from under the cliffs? How do we get yeah. them food? How do we you know, keep these, these mass exoduses from, you know, <coughs> how do we serve people in these situations? But actually, Let's stop the bombardment. Mm -hmm. Let's let's create stability so that this humanitarian work access. can happen. And how do you do yeah. that? You do it by having women at the table mm -hmm. who will be so highly invested in in the whole community life, in the family life, and that they will bring a different perspective. They bring a different style. They bring different values. And thank you for that. And I'm going to turn to. My very uh, longtime friend. You know what? I could have said old friend. We are getting there. <laughs> we are getting there. <laughs> um, and you are, she's now the UN Special Representative to the Secretary General on Sexual Violence, but we've been friends through many other jobs that you've had. Uh, would you bring this? I, I'm not going to take any of your time at the end with some kind of wrap up. I want you to be the final word here because I've been noting these different ideas about these, these lessons that we're, we're extracting from here. I would like for you to talk about from your experience any, any nugget that you think you can bring us here that, that will be a powerful lesson for us. I wish I could give you a two hours, I know, I know what you would do to this room if you could stand up here for two hours, but please send us on our way with, with some sense of hope from your own experience. Um, thank you very much, Sweeney. Um, By the way, I that's not how I pronounce <laughs> my name either. <laughs> so. Thank you. I think um, 
I speak as a special representative of the Secretary General on Sexual Violence. I think we have moved a long way like we had this morning with regards to empowerment of women. A lot of strides have been made the last 40 years. But as, as women, we still suffer a lot of discrimination. But I think the worst form of discrimination that women suffer is the issue of sexual violence in conflict, which has to do with the gang, with women and all that. I don't want to talk about the repercussion, but that has been a huge challenge right. across the world. And I think um, what the Security Council has done, starting with Resolution 1325, is to actually lay the legal framework globally so that people can be held responsible, they can try to end impunity, they can find ways and means to empower women, they can have the, the perpetrators accountable, that will fight the issue of stigma, you know, and provide support to survivors. When I took the job and during the briefing, and one of the things that I have tried to bring into the job is the issue of national ownership, responsibility, and leadership. I think the important issue that we must fight for is the issue of political will. The Security Council can pass resolutions, but if national governments do not implement this resolution, we're not going to make headway. And therefore, I think what we have to do is how we, we, we work with governments, encourage governments, force governments to be able to make sure they take ownership and lead from the front. And how do you do that? You cannot have solutions from outside. Right, right. We are trying to work with countries like Colombia and the others because I believe that governments, national governments, have the legal, primary, and moral responsibility to protect their citizens. And that's what we must put the emphasis on. And from the experience we're having now, for example, what we have discovered, police officers. We cannot prosecute, you can't take everybody to the egg. It's right. so expensive, right. you cannot. And from my personal experience coming from a post-conflict country, invariably, yes, we fight for command responsibility as a military, you know, because these are the people who give the instructions, who turn a blind eye. But at the end of the day, the people who do commit the crime are the foot soldiers. And these are not prosecuted. These are the ones who are integrated into the National <coughs> Army. These are the ones who are integrated into society, who come back into the society because they are not mentally disarmed during the DDR program. They go back into society and start raping people. If they are in the army, they go back. They, you have legitimized their crime because you have absorbed them into the national army That's and now they can crave, they can um, and, and they can rape with authority yeah. quote unquote yeah. so until you are able to make sure government national government develop the legal framework within the country to be able to make sure that crime the rape crime just as it's a war crime globally yeah. actually becomes a crime work with the police to make sure they have the ability to investigate work with the, the judiciary to make sure that they have the ability to prosecute. Right, right. And then you, you get involved with the civil society and the women's group, right. that this is a national issue. They recognize so that journalists will be able to, to report the crime adequately. Women's group can be empowered to fight the battle. That is the only way you shift the focus from the victims, the survivors, yeah, yeah. to the perpetrators. Do you remember when El you were in Liberia, yes. okay, when we went? Uh, and Eileen, you were there, and and um, Ellen Johnson Sirleaf said to the women, she said, "I want you all to go to the court. I want you to fill it, because they were saying, do something about rape, do something about rape." She said, "There's a rape trial coming up. I want you all to fill the court. Now, just to, as civil society, just to show. That, in other words, there's a role for everybody. No, everybody, everybody, it has to be accepted by everybody in the country." And that, that is what we talk about national ownership. Right. But that leadership, I just came back from the Central African Republic because, you know, the war has been going there for the last 25 years. Right. You know, so I met the armed groups. I, t I told them I have the tools to fight you. But that's not the issue. Here, you have to take responsibility. You have to release the women, the ones that you're holding in your camps. 
And I heard we had sat an agreement. I met them all. We sat down to talk. I said, this is what you have to do. If you don't, then I have the authority to be able to refer you to the ICC. But at the end of the day, this is what I want you to do. And I met the president. I said, you have to take ownership. I mean, the women look forward to you to defend them. And one of the challenges we are having now, for example, in the DRC, the heads of state cannot just stand up and say this is a crime. They cannot, the political leadership. And they have to take the responsibility. Because if the president of the DRC gets up and say this is a crime, what is he going to do? He's going to make sure the army have zero tolerance on, on rape. He will have to make sure anybody that is caught um, committing that crime will be punishable. He will develop the legal framework. He will take it to the parliament. They will pass the law, like we are now seeing in Colombia. So we are working with some countries who want to use as best practices. Because at the end of the day, until you are able to engage national government, which you are trying to do, regional governments, uh, ECOWAS, AU, so that they include it within their peace and security. I, to, I have a meeting. I had a meeting with the NATO special mm -hmm. representative. Okay. We've discussed with them. They're having a conference in May. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see how we can work with them. I have a meeting with the EU representative mm -hmm. of human rights and democracy because we did not succeed to get the European Union to actually have a special representative on security on women, peace and security. But they gave us human rights and democracy. So we're going to see how we're going to work with them right. to right. be able to make sure within and we're working um she's here my sister is here trying to we're going to spend two weeks or so in addis to make sure that the african union include it into their peace and security architecture as well as the sub-regional organization once you're able to have that entry point you are able to be able to to go at the national government because in this i give you the last example in the cr where i just came back we find out during the peace process and negotiation there was nothing about impunity there was nothing about accountability. So what I have succeeded in doing is actually now signing a joint communique with the armed groups, with the government, to be able So even the human rights group can now use that as an entry point. And, and, and ask them that in the, security, in the security sector reform, in the DDR, in all of the reforms they are having, judicial reform, they should actually make sure they mainstream the issue of rape and sexual violence in conflict. By so doing, the human rights people can now be able to monitor that aspect. Yeah. So at the end of the day, that that is the only way we can be able to make sure we we abolish my office. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I look forward to. Would you, would you retire with me? I will. <laughs> we'll take our we'll take our wheelchairs. We'll roll them out on the porch together. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Sena. Mm -hmm. You know, you said something that I am going to think a lot about, and it. It makes sense, but I just hadn't really registered. And that is that with the DDR, the disarmament, the you know the demobilization, the reintegration, that we must mentally disarm. And uh, that j I just, of, of course, and if you don't do that, the the crimes that were committed in in the war simply are inside the society, that is extremely important. And uh, that is just as true in our own. I, mean, I really want to say as an American that, that I, I feel very um, uh, aware, and I know President Clinton does as well, that we are not talking about other countries here. We're talking about ourselves as well. Uh, we have many very powerful ideas here. I know you all have been taking notes. I am not going to be a school marm, a school teacher here, and stand up and, and lay them out again. But I do want to, with you, thank the excellent speakers who have been with us this afternoon. <laughs> Well, you're the one who told me we had to <laughs> leave 20 minutes ago, so I'm going to take your word for it. Good. So a couple of, yes. Um, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, would you identify yourself? Of course. I, I'm Stephen Sacker. I, I work for the BBC. I have a show on the BBC. Oh. Um, and I've taken the show to Sri Lanka. I'm very interested in Sri Lanka. I've done a lot of reporting from Sri Lanka over the years. And 
it's great to have uh, all the presidents of Maratunga on the panel. I'd just like to ask you, what you said was very interesting about your efforts to build bridges, to come up with a program that would change the culture, to allow your idea of a political settlement to take root in the country. And you very honestly said, it, you know, in the end, you've got to say it didn't work. You know, you, you were booted out of office. The people who replaced you were ultimately of a different persuasion. And Sri Lanka has pursued the military option. And what we've seen, and I was in Sri Lanka more than a year ago and speaking to people in the Tamil North and particularly to women who were describing to me the most terrible atrocities. And I don't know if people in the room have seen some of the footage, video footage of- Channel 4. The Channel 4 footage, uh, which has gone around the world, very striking pictures of women uh, who have been brutalized and murdered and being tossed onto the backs of trucks as the male soldiers uh, from the Sri Lankan armed forces joke and laugh and make fun of them. Um, how could it be that the culture in the country could go into reverse so completely? And I just wonder whether in, in the Sinhalese majority community in your country, whether women in particular have in any way spoken out about the brutalization of Tamil women in the north of your country? Has you there know, been a space for them to do that? No. That is the answer. You know, you know that the press, the media is completely controlled by the present government. Yes. The people don't get the message at all. Now, when Channel 4 was shown all over the world and in the UK, I saw it in the UK, um, some of us started talking about it. I made a speech about it in Colombo and I was abused in editorials of government newspapers and told to shut up, I should shut up and I should get be just thrown into jail for talking on behalf of the Remy people and all that. People just do, do not know what is going on. There's absolutely no information. And now uh, people have started, various people have started, um, uh, what do you call them, web news, uh, news sites. And the government has burnt down uh, three times the office of one of those web websites. They arrested the editor of that. Uh, they go and block it. The military has various gadgets to block these things. Then the people go abroad and do it. You know, so in general, uh, most people do not know at all what is going on. They haven't a clue. If they do, I have personal experience, you know, when I talk to the women uh, in 1994, 95, 96, 97, and I appeal specifically to the wom wi women in one part of our program, where I said, you know, it's your children who are going and killing themselves, uh, trying to fight a useless war. And for what? Uh, and uh, I used to have all the women crying and saying, yes, we don't mind. Let's, let's share, give the Tamil people their rights and all this kind of thing. But today, there, there is a total blockage of all news for the last uh, seven years of, uh, what, about what is going on. People don't know. All that they know is that the war has ended, which everybody is happy about naturally because there are no bombs going off, no suicide bombers killing civilians in Colombo and the capital city. But they do not know the rest. But what, what you seem to be portraying is a, is a society which um, is not delivering any of the elements of, of justice, for example, that, that as we heard from Bosnia, have no. to be a precondition for long-term sustainable we have ended a war, but we have not won peace. We've lost it for the moment. The battle for peace has not even begun. And, and a part of that is that the, 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 the women of your country have not found a way of, of finding their voice or playing a political Do you role. know you that large numbers of people, 23 media people have got killed? within the first three years of this government for talking about yeah. things like that. Yeah. So people don't dare talk. Why is it just the women that have to sound out? No, well, well, it's, it's not just the women, but I'm, mean. just, I'm just looking at a society <laughs> where, where women have been... No, 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 no I, I'm just making a point. 
it's, 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 it's human rights we're talking you know, about. The it's women it's have a history of, do, you know, when we defeated the previous government, which was also more dictatorial than this one, much more. They were killing people, dumping bodies on the roads and all that. And that was the time I led my party and we came into power. Uh, we used, we, we mobilized the women. For example, there were about 40,000 young Sinhalese boys and girls who were killed by that regime. And we mobilized their mothers. They formed themselves into a mother's front. They were marching on the roads. And uh, they became a very powerful force for change and for changing the government, for defeating that government, bringing us into power and all that. But now, not only women, even the men are terrified to talk. They talk in whispers. For the first time, people have started coming out on the roads and protesting uh, because the government is trying to impeach the chief justice, the head of the judiciary. And uh, the lawyers, the judges and all are now on the roads. And they are going on strike. The courts have closed down, the courts of law. So things are beginning beginning to, uh, to, to, to uh, move. But still, even those people who are on the roads because they know that the Chief Justice is going to be impeached, do not know what is going on in Jakarta. Even today, the, the women who are alone, whose men have been killed in the war, uh, young Tamil women, girls of 11, 12, almost all of them are pregnant because they have to go and uh, see the army chaps who are in their camps every day. Nobody talks about this. Now, I know personally because the government keeps saying foreign journalists are doing this because they hate us, the West, the whites, <coughs> and all that kind of thing. But I know it because the soldiers and the policemen who are there, who I know, come under false names and things and report to me what is going on because they don't agree with this. It's not everyone who's doing it. But uh, I don't think even 1% of the population knows it. Let me so move on to there is a lot of work to be done. Let me move on to Benta Job and then if we have time. Okay. Yeah. Yes, and please. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I think uh, it has been a great session. And Benta, say who? Yeah, I, I'm Vinter Diop uh, from Senegal and the president of Farm Africa Solidarity. Mm -hmm. Just wanted to say Swami that is very informative in terms of where we started and where we are going in implementing, you said it from the beginning. We need to implement and I need to relate it to what Zainab has said and Zainab have a plan. And I think that uh, this plan of looking into political leadership and see how we can challenge the political leadership, especially in Africa, I think this is something that we have been missing for many times. To say that what do we do with, with them? Quote, you know, the ones that are on top there. And I like this morning what the Prime Minister of, of, of France said that sometimes even the women are the ones who march or demand, but you need to have that political leadership support to make sure that there is no more denial. Because in some cases in Africa, there is still the political leadership denial of the reality on the ground. It's not happening. So, so that is where I think that we need to knock some doors and say, this is happening, and we need to do something. The women can be crying out there most of the time, and we do. They do cry from everywhere. But the fact that nobody is listening to them doesn't make, you know, bring the difference in the ground. And I think that within the UN, if we start now saying, let's challenge the political, you, you are very brave. But what I can tell you, we see the society, we will be with you in this battle of challenging our leadership, our African leadership, because it's, it's now time it's now time to challenge them and time also to make sure that we change their attitude in this way in, uh, in women in conflict in particular. Thank you. Thank you, Brenda. I'm going to go to the back. Yes, would you tell us who you are? Hi, I'm Alias Arkart and I'm from the Clinton School of Public Service. Thank you all for coming. Um, my question is more, I want to understand, I understand the politics and the change that can happen in the post-war region. Um, my question is more for in the region where there is war going on, because we have so many countries currently in conflict. Um, I'm going to be working in Jordan to help Syrian refugees over the summer, and I want to understand how do we 
bring about peace and security that process early on, and especially for the plight of women in these refugee camps, and what can be done to change that dialogue? Because we have the, it, it's not in one region, it's all over. So just any thoughts on that would help. So you want to talk about some, some very positive, successful examples of working actually in refugee camps or in terms of elevating? Security, how that process of peace and security can be brought to these women in refugee In the camps, refugee camps, During right. the conflict, like in that conflict, how does, how does the security and the peace for women and their, their needs be addressed? How can we make that? Because there aren't, there isn't a time for it a female political leader to be at the tables. Um, often these are very patriarchal systems and societies that are highly militarized. So a woman's voice is not there to try and address the gender issues that are needed. So what what do we do in this conflict of time? How do we address those things then as opposed to afterwards and try and do damage control? How do we do it early? Because we know. Yes, Madam President. All I can say, it's a difficult exercise that you are demanding, but the only way to succeed, if at all, is for someone to go out there into the camps and mobilize the women. And what have you all seen? What does that look that, like? I think there are, two, there, are, there are a couple of issues. In, in conflicts, when, when, when I was working in Sierra Leone, I was actually documenting the atrocities and later, in later years, I became an expert witness for the special court and gave evidence because I had documented so many stories. But I, I had to hire people to work within the areas where the rebels were. So I was getting the information and I was using that information to actually engage the leadership of the armed groups to be able to say this is what is happening in your, in, in your own area, these are the facts. You were here this day. This was the person who went to this place. It, it was so factual, it was difficult for them to deny. That's, that's the, the, the one thing you do, because you have to have the information. You don't speculate. If you don't have the information, you cannot challenge them, because they will deny. Like Binta said, there is this syndrome of denial. In the case of, from the international level side, where I'm working now, I chair what we call the UN Women Action, which comprises of 13 UN agencies, starting from OCHA, the Humanitarian, UNICEF, UNDP, WH, and the others. And because these ha they all have their mandate. Humanitarian, once there is a conflict, and the, for example, in Syria, the, the women are coming out of Syria, what, what Valerie <coughs> is concerned about is to be able to make sure they provide food and shelter. But when I met her, I said to her, what I need from you as part of this network is to be able to make sure when the refugee women are coming out, these women, when they are being interviewed, we have to be able to make sure we know those who have been sexually abused so we can respond to them. Because if we don't know at that initial stage, the evidence will be lost, they'll be ashamed to talk. But while the process, so what I had said to them, I said, let's put the issue of sexual violence in the center of our relationship. Everybody brings something. When I spoke to Ellen Clark, I said to her, Ellen, you are the one who is dealing with the DDR. I want to make sure, right from the first day, you involve the issue of sexual violence. Because don't wait until you get to the R, the reintegration. Because by then, you'll have forgotten these people are going to be reintegrated either into the security forces or into the society. There is no other option. There are two ways of integration. You either integrate them into the security forces or you integrate them into society and leave them to go as ordinary citizens. Whichever way you do has repercussion with regards to increase of rape in the community. So it means once you enclose uh, them in the camp, you start the, the, the disarmament, you disarm them physically and disarm them mentally. So that by the time they get to demobilization, they start to you know what is it. And so by the time they get to reintegration, the third, the third phase, they now understand this is going to be a crime. We will punish you. We lock you up in jail. And at the same time, you work with the women. So each, everybody, in, in whether an NGO, they, they bring something on the table. It is how you can all work together as a team. That is the only way you can do. Because the, the job is bigger than any of us in this room. But each one of us have something we bring. And if we work together as a team with NGO, like Binta is saying, we are now going to the African Union. Binta, they have this gender, mi 
gender my gender whatever gender is my agenda campaign gender is my gender campaign so we are going to sit with them to see what we can do to work with them to network with them to strengthen them to support them because they are the ones on the field and with them together we can put pressure on the african union to say you have to put this so that member states become obligated because there are some who feel very distant from the un but they are closer to the african union it's a smaller enclave so if you are able you make sure you close all the loops that's the only way we can do it because I mean, it's difficult in Syria. I cannot start telling you Syria, Mali, Libya, the challenges. And there's a huge problem. But at the end of the day, it is the way we handle it. So we have to be there when it is needed. We know who first received the refugees. It's OCHA. It's UNHCR. I had to go to, I flew to Geneva to talk to my colleagues in UNHCR to see how we can work together so that when they are dealing with the refugees, they can be the issue of sexual violence. Everybody, so everybody deals with them. I think that's the only way we can do it because once the bomb starts coming down in Syria, nobody is allowed in there. It's the same thing we have in Mali today. Nobody is in northern Mali. And there's so much atrocity being committed there. So we have to be working to make sure when they're escaping, we can deal with it. And while the negotiation is going on, which is why I pinned down the armed forces in Central African Republic, I met the DDR committee had been set up, the program. So I said to them, I cannot put the gender minister, but I need um, with you to confirm to me that you have to collaborate and work very closely with the minister of gender. Mm -hmm. Because she now was, is being given and we're going to strengthen her capacity to bring the women NGOs together. Mm -hmm. But we've made sure we link her up to the committee, which includes the armed, force, the armed groups all who have signed into the peace agreement. So that's the way we say when we talk about national ownership. Thank you. Yes, I just want to very, yeah, I just want to very briefly on a question. I mean, uh, what you're asking is to not post-conflict thing. It's prevention, the situation yes. which we are. Mm -hmm. Prevention, it's possible only with the means which are out of the NGO sector, out of the media, out of the, but NGOs, media, and other ones have obligation to raise their voice in order to make a pressure on the people who can make decisions about the issue yes. that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, we have Bosnian example, which Swane is really, I mean, knows more than I am. I'm the guinea pig who survived the experiment. She's the scientist. Uh, but I mean, uh, a lot of people are saying today we should act quicker in Bosnia. Mm -hmm. It took a lot of pressure before people who were holding power were able to do according to their conscience because they felt the pressure and they, they would do it earlier. Mm -hmm. President Clinton is the one who would do it earlier, but he needed pressure from the voices from all over the world, from all over his state. That, that has to be stopped. And when Benghazi, and Benghazi started happening, a lot of people reminded what happened in Srebrenica, and one of the reasoning for Benghazi being bombed an international community acting under the UN Security Council approval is because they wanted to prevent Srebrenica being happening again. The great now, massacre of Srebrenica. Now, Srebrenica. Massacre of Srebrenica happening again. Benghazi intervention in Libya was done, among other things, by calling what happened to Srebrenica when the international community was waiting. Now, the question is, what is happening, what are we waiting in, in Syria? Is it more or less than happened in Benghazi? Unfortunately, there is much more atrocities and evil things happening in Syria right now. They were happening in, in Libya before intervention started. What was the difference? The key decision makers who can do prevention were statesmen from Security Council to the Green Powers, and who can make them do so? Again, every one of us. All of us being more louder, every one of us doing everything which we can to be voice that will move the people who in the end maybe want to be moved. Yeah. But they need, they have their constituencies, which they are responsible to. So that's the reason why I think in the end, the bottom line is evil you can beat, you have to beat, you know, to have justice. You have to have force that is standing after justice. <laughs> with all the respect, it is not going to be done in, uh, with holy water. It is going to be done with the force that is standing behind the justice. Legitimate force. And that's what, we, what, that's what all this what we are talking about. That's all of us 
what I'm doing today. And there is no Big Bang Theory. There are a lot of sand that has to be put there, and then Big Bang will happen. Camilla is going to have the last word here. Okay, in um, addition to all what the, they said, I just want to say that uh, according to our experience with um, uh, Comprehensive Peace Agreement, we, uh, we realized that uh, there was no uh, concrete uh, post-conflict uh, reconstruction uh, because there are a lot of things that happened during wartime and when we came for peace, post-peace now, we, 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 have, we find that there are a lot of trauma in, in the community where people need to be transformed, families need to be transformed. There are a lot of issues of uh, protection needed in either in the, in the IDB scam or, or in the refugee scam. This issue of protection is very much um, needed. There is economic empowerment. All this, you know, it has to, it has to take place in post-conflict so as to have the justice, um, uh, the issue of justice. We've talked about it earlier. Okay. Uh, President talked about it. Mr. President talked about it. And the issue of uh, sustaining peace, sustaining uh, whatever the agreement was done or the peace accord, all this ha needs to take place in order to, to sustain this. So I think just addition to all what they have said. What a rich time. Thank you all. I, my sense is that the discussion will keep going over dinner, throughout the evening. And I appreciate very, very much your attention. <laughs>